Gunter Gumli III was a dwarven noble from a long line that was very, very, very cursed. So with the help of some ancient tomes, he made a pact with an elder brain in the hopes this would break his curse. In return, he's been commanded to investigate what appears to be the workings of a different elder brain. Now he'll have to use his noble bearings, what little luck he has left, and a whole lot of chutzpah to get to the bottom of what's going on, and all while avoiding the peasant folk. But first, the rules. Rule number one, no other party members that have their own detached portraits, summons, and temporary companions such as Shovel are A-OK. -okay. Number two, no multiclassing, we're warlock and nothing but warlock. Number three, no using illithid powers whatsoever since I want to show off just how cool warlocks can be on their own. Number four, no respecking. We gotta plan out our build well, and any mistakes in that process we stick with. Number five, no barrel mancy. That includes chest mancy to block doorways and other such nonsense as well. Number six, no saving in the middle of combat. We're gonna have to work for our victories. Number seven, no karmic dice. This is to make the combat more of an authentic D&D experience and get true RNG. And finally, number eight, no changing the difficulty at any point. This is a tactician run, after all. As a side note real quick, these videos take a ton of time and effort to make, so I'd really appreciate it if you like and subscribe. With that out of the way, on to character creation. As previously stated, we're going a dwarf, specifically shield dwarf for the medium armor proficiency since we love not getting hit. We are also naturally a warlock, taking Eldritch Blast and Minor Illusion as our cantrips and going Great Old One for our patron, giving us access to some cool spells but also making it so when we crit, enemies in an area have a chance to get frightened. For our leveled spells, we end up going with Hex and Armor of Agathis for a mix of survivability and damage, while our background ends up being noble to go nice with our backstory. And our ability scores end up looking like this, with an emphasis on charisma as well as dexterity, which won't be immediately useful past initiative boost, but will help out our AC as we get later in the playthrough. Our skill proficiencies also end up befitting a dwarf of our lineage, with history, deception, intimidation, and persuasion. Now we've just gotta nail the noble look, and boy do we ever. And thus, a new legend, Gunter Gumli III, is born. Our noble warlock awakens in a crashing nautiloid after his investigation got out of hand and he ended up infected with an enemy parasite. Now he's got to get out of here before it's too late. Along the way a common soldier by the name of Lazelle jumps us and as she's threatening us we in turn get jumped by some nearby imps. We quickly explain to her that she's unworthy to be in our presence and she graciously understands and jumps off. Then we use Hex on one of the imps in our very first Eldritch Blast. Though it doesn't kill, just a few more on each of the imps takes them all out and that's our first encounter done. As we arrive at the helm we see quite the battle going on between mind flayers and devils, but fighting is to be done by foot soldiers, so we go dashing straight towards the control tentacles at the end of the room to teleport us back to somewhere safer. Unfortunately, the family curse kicks in and stray debris sends us plummeting down towards a rocky beach below, whereupon our patron is nice enough to catch us. The next morning we awaken ready to continue our task and hopefully get the enemy tadpole out of our head. Gunter gets exploring and we find a couple intellect devourers that we get the jump on, causing them to go down pretty fast to a couple eldritch blasts. A little further in the wreckage we find a mind flayer that doesn't even get the honor of our boot to finish it off. And just nearby we find a swirling portal with presumably a peasant stuck inside asking for help, but we've got bigger things to worry about than the common folk, such as getting a vantage point from the nearby ruins where we stumble across some folks arguing with each other. We're able to scare them off easy enough by using our knowledge of the occult and this gets us enough experience for level 2. Level 2 grants us another spell slot alongside a spell to go with it, for which we choose protection from evil and good, though it won't be with us for long. We also also get Eldritch Invocations, for which we choose Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast. Both of these buff up our Eldritch Blast in various ways, with Agonizing letting us add our Charisma mod to its damage and Repelling pushing away any enemies we hit with it, we're already much much stronger. From our vantage point we were able to spot some hubbub nearby in the form of goblins from the cult we're investigating attacking a camp. And despite having to help some bumbling bumpkins, we decide to get involved in case they can help us in return. We spend our turns using Hex to inflict more damage before blasting enemies, but the curse is still strong. Some of our temporary allies seem to know what they're doing, but unfortunately the grotesque goblins evidently have a much better grasp on things. Still, things start to turn in our favor as time goes on, and though some of our underlings die, it's worth it since it leaves our foes ripe for finishing off. With the fight done, we head inside the druid grove and find tensions are high between the landlords and the tiefling tenants hiding out here from the goblins. Regardless, we go chat with the druid leader Kaga and find her in the middle of trying to murder a child who was caught attempting to steal their sacred idol. We use this as an opportunity to assert our authority over the druid and as a side effect free the child. Now both sides of camp know that we mean business. Since the druids seem unlikely to be useful, we track down a thieves guild run by the tiefling children, where they offer us a reward in exchange for stealing the sacred idol, a reward that we really want, so we tell them we'll get around to it and then get back to exploring the wilderness. As we do, we encounter a strange man named 
Raphael, who appears out of thin air. It's easy enough from his sulfurous scent to identify him as a devil, and sure enough he offers us a deal in order to remove the tadpole we've got. But we've already got one patron that we are more than happy with, so we tell this belittling babbler to keep his presumptions to himself and bugger off. Continuing on, we find quite the good boy out in the wilderness. Unfortunately, the curse hits hard and we're unable to calm him down. Our patron, however, is nice enough to reset his memory and let us try again, where we learn his name is Scratch. We give him our scent so we can follow us later and move on. Just nearby is a village being occupied by goblins. It's not hard to convince them that we belong, whereupon we pick up the haste helm from a nearby chest. This is a pretty straightforward helmet that gives three turns of momentum at the start of each combat. For each turn remaining, we get 1.5 meters of additional movement to help us get into position when we need it. We also managed to hit level 3 from this conversation, increasing our spell slots up to level 2 and letting us choose the Pact of the Tome, which grants Guidance, Vicious Mockery, and Thorn Whip as extra cantrips. Guidance is phenomenal for helping us get past skill checks. Vicious Mockery is pretty much useless, and Thorn Whip has its occasional uses for pulling enemies into pits. In addition, we get to choose another spell in the form of Darkness, and we swap out Protection from Evil and Good for Cloud of Daggers, since the scrolls are easy enough to come by. Darkness is real good and gets straight up silly in certain fights with how it affects enemies whereas Cloud of Daggers is just some nice consistent AoE damage. While we're in the village, we decide to have some fun. We scare off some more goblins, play the age-old game How Far Can You Catapult a Peasant, and get looting a hidden occult basement that reminds us of home. Notably, we grab a scroll of Summon Quasit and a tome called the Necromancy of Thay. After using the scroll, we summon Shovel, a very eager Quasit who is more than happy to act as our new familiar, especially when we tell her our future plans. And since we're a warlock, we gain the ability to summon her whenever we want once per short rest. Further north, we come across a burning inn and learn that Grand Duke Ravenguard could be inside. Gunter is well aware of how important it is to have nobles that owe you, so we get rescuing. Unfortunately, as we get to the top and blast open the doorway, all we find is Counselor Floric instead. Either way, when we get outside, she rewards us with the Spell Sparkler, a quarter staff that grants us two lightning charges when we deal damage with a spell or cantrip. Lightning charges decay at a rate of one per turn, but so long as we have at least one, we gain a plus one to attack rolls and we deal an extra lightning damage on everything. Should we reach 5, the next time we deal damage, we do an extra d8 lightning and the charges are consumed. It's just a temporary item for us, but that doesn't mean it's not amazing. Now that we've got a bit more power, we double back towards the village and climb down the well where we could hear some strange noises. Before we go too far, we turn Shovel Invisible and drop an armor of Agathis on ourselves. Sure enough, we find the biggest spiders you ever did see in need of squashing, so we get the drop on them with a cloud of daggers, and as they're reeling from the shock, we start blasting at another one. In retaliation, that one tries to shoot us to no avail, while our cloud shreds apart the two appalling arachnids caught inside. One does barely survive and runs up to us, but Shovel is waiting patiently for just this moment. When it gets back to us, we use a well-placed thorn whip to pull the phase spider into our cloud, bringing it low enough to die when it tries to take a turn. The poor remaining fool wastes its turn dashing on up to us, which just gives us a perfect repelling blast right into our daggers yet again, and well, you know how that one goes. As we head deeper in, we stumble across a very big spider. That might take a bigger Eldritch Blast to squash. Yep, definitely gonna need to go at this one a little smarter. On our next attempt, we actually do manage to take out the matriarch, but while we're cleaning up the little ones, our curse kicks in and the web we were standing on just breaks and kills us for no real reason. So we decide to go at this a different way. Climbing back up to the village, we go chat with some ogres that we spotted earlier. We convince them that we're friends, and better yet, convince them to fight for us in exchange for gold that they'll never see. But let's be real, gold is just worth more when it's kept in the hands of noble folk anyways. With some bodyguards in tow, we head back down and summon them into the fight, but when the Spider Queen hits us, the curse kicks in and makes the ogres think it was us, which goes how you think it would. <sighs> okay, this time for real. We start with an invisible shovel attacking to surprise them, then we break the web the matriarch is standing on to deal a ton of damage, and to enter combat, blast one of the little spiders. To top things off, we summon the fellas to come help us out and earn their imaginary wage. The eagle-eyed eight eyes start sniping Gunter, summoning even more spiderlings, and also, they immediately take out Shovel. In a couple rounds with a couple blasts, we manage to take out one of the spiders, and our temporary henchmen finally kick into gear to start dealing damage. Whenever we can, we shoot the web out from under the matriarch, while leaving the ogres to do their thing against anyone who comes near them. Just from shooting the webs, the queen gets pretty low, but we still have to heal up from the odd hits that we take here and there. At one point, the mama spider gets on our case, so to be extra safe, we down a potion of speed, disengage to run away, and heal up. 
This finally gets the ogres fighting the queen herself, and she in turn starts taking them out, which is exactly what we want. When the two remaining ogres and the matriarch are all low and grouped up, we throw a smoke powder bomb into the lot to deal with them all. I mean, they didn't really think they were worthy of our hard-earned gold, did they? <laughs> Either way, one more blast on the remaining spider, and that's that solved. Our reward is a dark amethyst that we find on the ground. This lets us pop open and read the Necromancy of Thay, which, after passing some saving throws, gives us the Forbidden Knowledge permanent buff. This is just a plus one bonus to wisdom saves and checks, but hey, every bit counts, and we're not one to say no to Forbidden Knowledge. More importantly, with the help of a Featherfall scroll, we jump deep underground where every dwarf knows the really good stuff can be found. Instead of the really good stuff, though, we find a Myconid colony, and though we're no fan of fungus, it's good enough for a safe spot down here. Well, here we meet Omeluum, who's intrigued by our situation and offers to help weaken the tadpole in our head if we go find some certain type of mushrooms from a nearby arcane tower. It's easy enough to find, but the security measures are turned on, so we need to head to the garden at the bottom and grab an anti-magic bloom that we pop into the generator to turn the lights on and the turrets off. Just upstairs, we find the ingredients we're looking for, but since we're here, we might as well keep looking for other goodies. We find all sorts of books and notes on our way up, and when we reach the top, a robot recites passages from them to us. Upon responding in kind, we're given a cool ring that lets us cast light and grants unimpeded access to the rest of the tower, where we also break this chair and grab its leg to acquire the club of hill giant strength. This club sets the wielder's strength to 19 so long as you're holding it, which is really nice for weaker folks like ourselves. We're not going to be using it quite just yet, but keep it in mind for later. As we return to Omeluum, he whips up the promised potion for us, though it ends up making the tadpole stronger than ever, which is a bit unfortunate. To make it up to us, he sells us some gear from his special inventory, such as the boots of stormy clamor. These reverberating runners make it so when we inflict a condition, we also inflict two turns of reverberation. For each turn a creature has, they take a minus one to all physical saves. Plus, if they reach five stacks, they take 1d4 thunder damage and have to make a DC 10 con save or fall prone. You might think these aren't great right now, but for whatever reason, each Eldritch Blast we fire counts as inflicting a condition. I don't know if it's because of the push or what, but I won't look a gift boot in the mouth. With an extra bit of power, we decide it's time to finally continue investigating this cult of the Absolute. As we're walking towards their camp, we get hit by a crazy mental attack from the Absolute itself, and learn of her chosen champions. While we're rendered incapable of moving, this cool magical artifact with a peasant attached to it comes to rescue us. Unfortunately, she assumes that we need her help, so we tell her to bug her off, but she decides to stay put instead, so we move on. Once inside the camp, we meet a goblin in need of crushing called Crusher, who asks us to kiss his foot. We try and intimidate him in turn, which doesn't work, and a brawl breaks out instead. A single cloud of daggers is all it takes to get him to surrender, and to assert dominance, we just stand in the cloud and look down on him, in every sense of the phrase. Then he sulks off to be by himself, and we follow him to finish our revenge by blasting him to his death, which really annoys that peon from earlier. Ah well, no harm in taking out yet another nuisance. Since she won't be bothering anyone anymore, we grab her artifact and also loot Crusher to grab a ring called Crusher's Ring. Go figure. This is a pretty simple trinket that gives an extra 3 meters of move speed. It's not crazy, but when our base is 7.5, an extra 3 is very, very nice. Deeper inside the camp proper, we meet Minthara, a leader of this camp and a true soul of the Absolute. She makes it clear that she's struggling to find the Druid Grove, and a thought occurs to us. We figure if we ingratiate ourselves with her, we might have an in with the cult and access to their leaders. Instead of letting her raid the grove, though, we come up with a plot to deal with it for her as an extra favor. Before we enact it, we find an imprisoned Volothamp, a famous and well-connected wizard, so we pop up in his cage to free him and ensure our noble name is carried far. He is quite well learned, too, and offers his help, so we tell him to meet us at our camp where he can feel free to pick our brain. This gives us enough experience to hit level 4, granting us another cantrip in the form of Bone Chill, mainly to help us against enemies who have access to healing in the future. We also get to learn Hold Person, a really good spell for disabled an enemy and guaranteeing critical hits. It's also very nice when upcasted, which is wonderful for warlocks. And of course, we get to choose a feat. Since our goal is to circumvent our curse, what better way than getting Spell Sniper to expand our critical range and make our luck better whether it likes it or not. This feat also lets us get Shocking Grasp as an extra cantrip for those tough situations when we're in melee, especially against enemies wearing metal. Now it's time to enact our plan. We're back to the grove and right next to the idol where we cast Grant Flight in preparation, before yoinking the idol right from under them, which causes 
causes the druids to go into an uncontrollable rage and start murdering all the poor peons squatting in their grove. As the fight starts, Shovel stays behind to deal with the five or so druids here while we fly off to champion the common folk and make sure they don't die before we can make proper use of them. Most of this fight is spent with Gunter blasting away whoever's got their back turned while the two factions wail away on each other with both sides taking losses while Shovel continues to 5v1 no problem. Eventually, the peons will get their butts kicked without our intervention, so we do have to actually spend spell slots if we want this grove to be as weak as possible by the end. This poor druid doesn't seem to realize they're winning and they decide to end it all with an assist from our cloud of daggers. It's a doozy of a fight, and it takes quite a while. Plenty of druids get killed by Lord Goomly. Shovel lasts eight whole rounds before she gets taken out, but eventually the last of our conscripted cronies go down with just a few druids left. All this means is we've got to spend our turns repelling the survivors away as we kite them backwards. Which is made easier when Kaga drops a plant growth in between us and them, and then drops yet another one since I guess she must owe our family a favor. Either way, a well-placed magic missile scroll takes out the last of Kaga's dastardly druids, and with a whole lot of kiting we lose were her up to the top of the gate where we blast her off to an early demise. Our efforts weren't just to weaken the camp, we also stole the idol so we could hand it to the tiefling kids for our promised reward, the Ring of Protection. Which grants us an extra plus one to our AC and saving throws, not the most complicated item but it goes a long way towards boosting our survivability and golly gee if it ain't worth adorning our noble hands. With the druids out of the way, we return to Minthara to tell her the good news, as well as the location of the grove so we can finish off the tieflings together. As we head to bed to give Minthi some time to get ready, we notice Volo seems to have vanished into thin air, so no reward for us, I guess. And to make things worse, we find we slept through the assault the next morning, though they don't seem to hold it against us. Oh well, we have a party in our honor to celebrate a job well done, and despite Volo showing up in the cutscene, he's still nowhere to be found in the real world, so it seems the curse got to him. Either way, Minthara gives us a cool little harp and tells us it will help us get to their headquarters in the Shadow Cursed Lands. Once the party is done, we set off towards the mountain pass in search of Git that we heard were camping out here, and any powerful tools that they may have. Sure enough, we arrive inside their crash and speak to their quartermaster, Ajak Nirjira, who sells us the knife of the Undermountain King. Most of the abilities of this weapon don't do much for us, but the expanded crit range sure does, meaning we now crit on an 18 or higher. And since it's a light weapon, we get a paired alongside the Club of Hill Giant strength that we got earlier, so anything strength related is a whole lot easier. To test out our newfound power, we head upstairs to go blast away on some kobolds. Admittedly, Cloud of Daggers does most of the work here, absolutely shredding away at every single enemy that runs through this little choke point. And once they're nice and low, all it takes is a couple fire arrows to blow up the very alcohol-dense kobolds. Further upstairs still, we find some Gramishkas to test our strength on. And we also start shooting with an offhand hand crossbow each turn since we're not doing anything else with our bonus action, though we don't have proficiency so it's pretty much useless. They do some weird stuff when spells are cast around them, like duplicating and full healing, so it takes quite a while, but we still get them all with relatively little headache. Since we're pretty close to level 5 afterwards, we head down to the Underdark where we stumble across a false god trying to pull one over on the simple-minded masses. After a successful persuasion check, we're able to make a devilish deal done dirt cheap, and all it costs is helping Bual pull one over on the common folk, which we love doing anyways. In exchange, we get to level 5, and this is a big one. Our spell slots upgrade to 3rd level, and we learn Hunger of Hadar along with a free haste, call lightning, and animate dead from our packed boon once per long rest each. These are all really good spells, with Haste and Hunger of Hadar in particular being pretty nutty for keeping enemies away while dealing good damage. But it gets better, because our proficiency bonus goes up to plus 3, making everything we do stronger, and all of our cantrips get improved, meaning Eldritch Blast fires 2 beams now. And to top it off, we get a third Eldritch Invocation in the form of Devil's Sight, which lets us see through magical darkness, allowing us to attack enemies from safety. It doesn't get much better than this. Now we've really got to test our strength, so we get exploring and find out the nearby swamp has a massive illusion all over, which means there must be a powerful fey at work. And to the surprise of absolutely no one, in a mysterious hut nearby, an old crone is yelling at a captive younger girl named Mayrina. When Mayrina continues to be a nuisance, Auntie Ethel teleports her away, leaving us alone with just her. A fey like this is bound to have some powerful stuff hidden away, so we get investigating a hidden entrance in the fireplace, and when she spots us, a fight kicks off. Her nearby gnomish neighbors start joining the fight, and we send Shovel to go distract the horrendous hag. Since all the goons gotta make it through the doorway, we put a hunger of Hadar right 
right in their way. Unfortunately, right after, Shovel gets got, but our hunger works out perfectly, slowing them all down. The curse still hits our Eldritch Blast hard though, even with advantage. At the start of her next turn, Ethel skedaddles downstairs and leaves us dealing with the red caps, which takes a lot longer than it ought to just because of how strong our family curse is. We even have to use our brand new haste, but our overwhelming amount of beams gets them all in the end. Continuing on, we head into the basement where Ethel tries to seduce us for our family money before vanishing in a puff of smoke. This has us rattled to our bones, so we head back upstairs and summon our zombie for the first time as well as get Shovel back for emotional support. Then we spot some dirty hillbillies in her basement and as Shovel is trying to get the drop on them, she unfortunately steps in a puddle and starts the fight early. Meanwhile, Gunter sneaks into position and uses darkness, followed up with some eldritch blasting. First blood in this brawl goes to Shovel, but soon after they get our zombie in return. All the while, we're blasting them away with our favorite cantrip. Since they're focused on our summons the whole time, it really isn't that challenging, and Shovel holds her own quite well, taking out another one before she gets got in return, leaving us to avenge her. Now that the way is clear, we feather fall down to the bottom, where we resummon Shovel, turn her invisible, turn ourselves invisible, hit the button to free Marina so we can use her as leverage to negotiate, and then cast darkness near where we think Ethel is. This really throws her for a loop, evidenced by the fact that instead of her usual chicanery, she just keeps trying to claw us while she's blind. Even when we get a good couple crits which push her out and frighten her, she'd still rather just skip her turn. And the next turn, she just runs right back in and starts clawing away all over again. Which means we can just blast away over and over with the help of a speed pot to make things go faster. When she gets brought below 30 HP, she surrenders and offers us power in exchange for letting her leave with the girl. This is the most value the farm girl's life will ever have, so we'd be doing a disservice to her if we declined this deal. With the deal made, we get a permanent plus one to our charisma, bumping it up to 18 and improving our chance to hit, our damage, and our spell save DC. Speaking of power, we've heard there's more to be found in the Underdark, just across the lake, but there's Dwergar in the way, so we down a Bloodlust Elixir and sneak up on them. As we get blasting on one next to an edge, the first two beams miss, and the next round our cantrip gets counterspelled, which makes this personal. The Dwergar dunces start running up the hill towards us, while their leader reanimates every corpse around, which naturally all come right at us. We have Shovel reveal herself behind them at this point to act as a distraction and slow them down, while we drop a Hunger of Hadar to do the same. On our next round, since some of them wandered out of the hunger, we use a Void Bulb to pull them all back in, and Shovel continues to wreak havoc, as well as eat enemy spells. Unfortunately, she gets done dirty and gets taken out off camera a moment later. Gunter keeps chucking Void Bulbs for now to keep the enemies all tangled up in the hunger while we make some distance so they don't step out and immediately run us down. But while this is going on, we notice the enemies are saving on our spells quite a lot, so we take a look and for whatever reason, our DC is 12 when it should be 15. Seems our curse got to our other spells too. Still, I don't really know what to say about this other than I hope it fixes itself, because it makes using any spell with a DC much harder to justify. Regardless, we keep blasting at whoever's closest, and our bloodlust elixir triggers on the zombies, even when their undead fortitude keeps them standing, so we get a blast again. With the amount of distance we have on them at this point, it's not hard to keep the scarier enemies at bay, but their leader does get an insane 35 meter counter spell at one point, which is almost twice as far as the actual range of the spell, so good for him. Either way, we keep kiting, even dropping another hunger of Adar when the enemies start to catch up, which ends up taking out all the remaining zombies. And then we end up moving just a tad too far, causing initiative to break, giving the devilish Dwergar a chance to full heal right before we aggro them again. They're not nearly as scary without their backup though, and at one point we even manage to trigger a Frighten and a Reverberation prone on the same turn, which forces the enemy to skip their turn, since they can't do anything without standing up, and they can't stand up since they can't move, leaving them ripe to be picked off the next round. Eventually, the leader catches up with us too, and with a gnarly thorn whip we yank him into the Great Void. All we need to do after that is take care of his buddy that he reanimated, and the fight is done. With them out of the way, we hop onto their boat and get sailing across the lake, where we're set upon by some other Dwergar who don't quite believe our lies. But they do a great impression of a boppet, so we get pushing, and yanking, and maybe even a bit of pulling to send them all to a watery grave. Before we continue on, we double back to the beach to loot their bodies that have washed up on the shore, where we get the bow of the Banshee. This plus one short bow makes it so as long as we're holding it, we have a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls against frightened creatures. I know it says a whole lot more than that, but that's the only bit that actually works with Eldritch Blast. We don't frighten enemies a ton right now, but once it starts to be more of a regular thing, the d4 bonus to hits will be quite nice. Upon arriving across the lake, we end up in Grim Forge, where tensions are high between the Dwergar and the Absolute Cultists that they find themselves working for, especially so since their leader, Nier, is stuck in a cave-in. So we come up with an idea. We convince the simple-minded goons to rally against Nier, and then we'll take Nier's side so we can gain the favor of the higher-ups. 
All we need to do is take out the scrying on nearby, then we pop open the rubble that was blocking the way. The big man comes stumbling out, immediately blaming the slaves, as he should, and then the fight starts with us, as planned, on the side of Nier. It's a little chaotic at first, but we get some good hits in. Unfortunately, our enemies do too. They even end up taking first blood, but our side isn't too far behind in avenging them. Gunter blasts away, and we do our best to take out the easily influenced Dwergar, but alas, Nier is pretty insistent on getting hit by every single attack and gets killed after just a few rounds. When things start to look dire, we cast darkness on ourselves, and it's a good thing too since our last ally gets got with a throw a moment later. So we send Shovel on distraction duty where we do our best to hit pretty much any attack. Our distraction does not last long, but it doesn't rage us when she falls. After all, only we're allowed to beat up our servants. This causes the crits to start pouring in, keeping the enemies unable to do anything as we pick them off one by one. With just one left, we use Hunger of Adar to really bully them, and as they fumble about trying to get out, that's the last of them dealt with. Except for this man, who I've never seen before in my life, but shows up to tell us about how Nier is dead before sprinting into a poison-filled room at Mach 10. Well, our plan didn't work, but continuing on, we tell the Mykonids the Dwergar are dead, and they reward us with Bliss Spores, which grant an extra 1d6 to all of our rolls until our next long rest. And we also use an elixir of heroism to grant a d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws, which we'll need for what's to come. Like fighting some sentient armor who are guarding something that we really want. They fail to do anything meaningful to us as they get pushed off cliffs by our repelling blast and also get quite easily kited around the place until they're all gone, letting us pick up both the scale mail mold and the piece of mithril ore that we'll be using at the titular Grimforge itself. Gunter pops in the ore, and then the mold lowers the platform, puts on Nier's boots which will let us use a Misty Step for free, down a potion of glorious vaulting, and cast Mirror Image before spinning the Lava Valve, which causes the titanic guardian construct of the Forge Grim to come sauntering on out, ready to rumble our day. We start by jumping directly across the way, so that the clobbering construct follows us and stops right on the anvil in the center, perfect for an invisible shovel to pull the lever and crush the reeling robot, dealing about a third of its health as damage. This does summon a bunch of magma methods, but we've got a scroll of ice storm for just this occasion, instantly dealing with all of them. On our next round, we try and hop on back to the start and the auto-pathing decides to dip us into the lava. So we've got to spend our action throwing a potion to heal up, and then we jump to the other side. Meanwhile, Shovel pulls another MVP distraction play, baiting out a crit hit, and making it so Grim walks right back onto the perfect hammering position, which we trigger with an Eldritch Blast. While the angry automaton is getting back up, we cast Hunger of Adar right in the center so the difficult terrain slows it down. Then next turn, we jump across the way to lure it into position yet again. Our plan works, but it also gets a killer stomp off, breaking our concentration and dealing heavy damage. Despite Gunter reeling from a con Concussion, we still get up and blast the lever once more, barely not killing Grim. Funny thing though, when it stands back up it's in just the right spot to get superheated while still being on the anvil, and hey, I'm not one to look a gift Grim in the mouth. As a reward, we get a hard one adamantine scale mail, 16 AC medium armor that reduces all damage by one, gives disadvantage on stealth checks, immunity to crit hits, and when an attack hits us, they get sent reeling for two turns. For each turn of reeling that they have, they get a minus one to attack rolls, making them less likely to hit us. This is a pretty nice boost to our survivability, but it won't be our permanent armor. There is just one last thing we've got to do now before we can move on to the Shadow Crush lands. Time to figure out what the Gith and the Kresh know. Turns out they're really interested in that artifact the girl we murked earlier was carrying, so we use it to negotiate passage to their leader, who is significantly less interested in cutting a deal with us as everyone else has been so far, and while we're trying to work something out, his false god Lich Queen shows up. She asks us to go inside the artifact and kill whoever's inside, and since our patron warned us to be cautious, we agree though we're not happy about it. When we arrive inside, we find the man of our dreams, literally. They've been talking to us in our sleep, giving us advice and warning. Since they seem to mean no immediate harm to us, and they're clearly okay with letting us be in charge, we decide to let them live. Not to mention, they also claim to be what's protecting us from turning into an enemy mind flayer. So they send us on our way to face the Gith outside, with a temporary bless, a scroll of false life for 7 temp HP, and a bloodlust elixir. And of course, alongside Shovel, plus a reanimated Gith corpse that we found laying around here. We step outside and the final showdown begins. The crossbowman that goes before us misses their tripping attack thankfully, and Shovel gets a nice sneaky hit on one of the Ardents. On our turn, we use a potion of speed, alongside not one, but two cast of Eldritch Blast to finish that one off and trigger our elixir, letting us run past the remaining Gith and with our last action cast Darkness so they focus on our hired help. The big boss man buffs up on his turn, while the remaining Ardent takes out Shovel and one of the swordsmen instantly mercs our zombie. Next round, we're able to finish off another Gith with 
two casts of our favorite cantrip, but the reverberation kills them, which doesn't trigger our bloodlust. We're pretty far from the enemies though, so they spend their turns just dashing on up to reach us, leaving them open for some beautiful crits, which frighten all but their leader. However, this is our last turn of speed pot, so we also spend our bonus action refreshing it. Strangely enough, when our turn ends, even the leader refuses to do anything. I had heard darkness can break enemy AI like this, and it's not something I want to make a habit out of, but we'll use it to our advantage at least this once. We again fire up the Gatling gun, and with our advantage attacking from darkness, we get crits galore, taking out one more gith and frightening the leader. The Inquisitor is unable to do a darn thing due to his rightful fear of Gunter, while the remaining gith goon dashes up to us. Which is their last mistake, as they get blasted down, and over the course of the next couple rounds, we give the same treatment to their poor solitary boss. Now that they're all dealt with, we saunter away and get out of dodge, before the rest of the crash rains down on us, heading to Grim Forge where we spotted an entrance to the Shadow Curse lands. Some terrifying threats no doubt await us, but with our patron backing us up and our curse gradually being circumvented by the power we gain, we're feeling far more ready than ever before to find what lies next in Gunter's journey. Thank you all again for watching the first part of A New Journey. Here's the stats for this act, along with some fantastic artwork of the real star of the show, Mogging, made by Shortcake Yuki on Discord. The live streams for Act 2 will start up on Monday, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, a very special thanks to our storyteller tier members, Bunny Warren, Player5, Damon, Larry Renzokuken, The Big Yeet, LeFay, Mark Rainbow, Garrett Sapp, and The Rat King.